Hey, hello everybody, and welcome to our Twitch series about messaging. I'm Tim Bray, I'm a senior engineer here at Amazon, and I work on a lot of different messaging services, and one of them is Amazon MQ, what you see on the screen there, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And I have with me here Trevor Dyke, who's the uh, product manager for MQ, so if you're out there on Twitch and have any really super hard questions about the details of the product, Here's your guy. Now, I should mention that Trevor and I are coming to you from Vancouver. So behind this boring, opaque screen, <laughs> fabulous view of Vancouver Harbor and mountains and ships and so on. But there's just way too many photons. If, if we open that, the camera goes crazy and we vanish. So sorry about that. <laughs> also joining us from San Francisco, we got Brock Miramontes, who's CTO and founder of uh, Crew. There's their website at crewapp.com. And uh, they do a, a, a messaging service that he's going to talk, talk, talk us all about. Now, the title, the title of this session is, I believe, um, Messaging for Migration and Modernization. The migration side of that is because uh, Amazon MQ, the thing we're going to talk about today, has a very strong compatibility story and might be of really strong interest to you if you're migrating out of the enterprise, uh, out of the on-premise enterprise situation. Uh, but today, I think we're going to start up by talking about modernization with, with Crew, which is a nice modern cloud-native app that, that uses uh, the Amazon MQ technology. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Brock to talk about that in a sec. But before I do that, I should say that this is Twitch, and anybody can shoot us a question at any time, and um, uh, feel free to do that, because it's you know really super interesting when we spend time talking about the things that you actually care about, as opposed to what we think you should care about, in theory. So, okay, let's turn it over. Brock, you want to tell us about Crew? I think I've got some screenies here. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Crew is a communication app that keeps everyone <clears throat> on the same page about everything work-related. Uh, really, it's, it's about frontline employees, and we've geared the app towards that. These are the people that work in the restaurant industries, retail industries, uh, firefighters, nurses, and a ton of different other ones. Um, as you see from the screenshot, Crew looks like a normal text messaging app, um, but it's a lot more than just chatting. Uh, we've worked really hard to integrate a lot of functionality and workflows into the app to give employees the ability to be successful at work and more efficient. And so right here, this screenshot is kind of what the inbox, the chats tab. Uh, at the very top here, you can see the central market is the name of this organization. On Crew, an organization is the fundamental, fundamental unit of a team. Um, really, it, it kind of maps nicely to a business location, but we've left it pretty flexible. So a given business can use organizations to structure in a way that makes sense to their business. Um, also, uh, a user can be part of multiple organizations if they have multiple jobs or just want to use Crew for other reasons. Um, really, as you kind of navigate down the screenshot, you can see conversations between individuals, uh, conversations between, uh, oh, back one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, conversations between kind of the workplaces. Uh, you also kind of notice some things around team files, tasks, and availability. Um, these are just quick ways for users to navigate to different parts of functionality in the application, and also a way to alert them that stuff might pertain to them. Uh, and if you skip over to the next screenshot now, this is the coworkers tab. Um, funny enough, uh, a lot of these uh, workplaces, it's really hard to figure out how to contact people, who's working with you, all the stuff of that nature. And so the coworkers tab give, gives you a nice snapshot of all the employees in this organization, along with a quick way to contact them. And so if you go kind of the next screenshot here. Uh, this is what a typical uh, chat looks like within Crew. Uh, if you notice kind of media messages, text messaging, but also at the very bottom here, we have these little avatars. Uh, this is a way for everyone to keep up with what, who's seen what messages and kind of stay on top of the conversation. And actually, you can go into more detail if you go to the next screenshot. Uh, this is what the message details looks like. Uh, this has a nice tight accounting of who's seen what messages, who hasn't seen these messages, along with all the reactions. You see those little avatars under the message there. People can give kind of uh, just single statement reactions to each of the messages. And so in a lot of businesses, especially when making important announcements, they really need to know who's seen what messages and not. And honestly, actually on the not seen tab there, we have a little feature where you can actually remind people to come back to the app to kind of see things. Uh, go to the next tab. Uh, this is kind of a, a, the calendar tab. And so uh, a lot of the workplaces that are utilizing Crew, um, the shift schedule meetings are really important to them. And so this is kind of a nice snapshot to be able to see upcoming events, when you might be working again, and actually see who you're working with. Um, but one of the features that we actually power, I kind of mentioned before, workflows, is around kind of uh, training shifts. Um, so if you go to the next screenshot, 
in a lot of these industries, um, trying to figure out who can work and uh, when to work is kind of important. And so uh, some people sometimes can't come in and they need to get their shift covered. And so crew, uh, oh, sorry, before crew, uh, a lot of industries, you have to rely upon a mix of text messaging, phone calls, getting a hold of your manager. And then with fingers crossed, that'll get reflected back on the calendar at work. Um, with yeah, crew, my my able son to- is currently working at, at Starbucks and scheduling <laughs> hell is a permanent factor of life there. Right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so with crew, we've actually, uh, in the app, have a workflow so you can actually say so you need someone to cover your shift. Everyone in the organization will be notified. Uh, people can start requesting, and then an administrator is actually required to approve. Um, that way, the whole workflow is integrated into the application. Along with that, it's actually kept within the chats. So if you need more clarifying questions, talk about things, they can quickly act within the feed, just like with these cards I'm showing right here. Um, and so if you go ahead and move to the next screenshot, this is uh, Gold Stars. Um, one of the best things that we can make <laughs> do to make people more efficient at work is make it happy to be at work. And so within Crew, we've integrated in some uh, recognition systems to allow people to give gold stars and let people know they've done a good job or they appreciated the effort and work they've put in. Um, and so that's kind of all the screenshots here. But just to kind of give you a sense of kind of uh, Crew and kind of why we're using these messaging applications such as Amazon MQ is all this information is being interchanged with multiple clients all day long every day in near real time. Uh, on Crew right now, uh, people are creating more than 10 million communication events uh, every week. And basically, with each one of those communication events, there are many multiples of events that have to happen in our internal systems. And so with Amazon Q right now, it's powering the backbone is able to deliver all this content to all these different devices. So it's probably worth saying before we dive into this, it turns out that Amazon MQ is a hosted, managed uh, implementation of ActiveMQ, which is a popular Apache licensed open source product. And, and Brock, obviously, messaging's been at the center of what you've been doing here for a while. And I think you've got a few years of hands-on with, with, with ActiveMQ. So speaking as, a, as an authoritative expert on that subject, <laughs> why, 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 Amazon, why ActiveMQ for, for this particular application? Um, yeah, so I, I've actually, for probably about the last eight years, I've been on and off using ActiveMQ for various things. Um, really, we actually started out not wanting to use ActiveMQ because we're really kind of um, for trying to use more hosted services. That's why I've been utilizing AWS for a lot of other things. But sadly, when we try to utilize um, SQS at first and a couple other services, uh, we had some latency issues. And really what ended up happening is because of the latency and us being a real-time communication app, it really had a center around trying to figure out the best way to do that. And at the time, uh, we started with ActiveMQ. Um, it also was pretty nice because we're uh, JVM-based on, on the back end. And with JMS, it provided a pretty uh, high-throughput infrastructure to be able to send messages through. So one of the important things about, uh, about uh, Active. Uh, that uh, is a little bit different from your typical cloud managed service is it's not RESTful, it's not HTTP. Mm -hmm. You actually nail up a TCP IP, TCP IP connection to the uh, broker and shoot bytes back and forth across it. So what does that mean from the point of view for, of somebody who's using this? Yeah, I mean, so a couple different things. First off, um, it it's only helps latency because you're not having to pull and have to re recreate HP connections all the time. It also reduces a lot of load on the uh, servers having to query the service. Uh, they're not having to spin up a lot of connection pools in order to kind of manage that. And so really, um, it just kind of plays hand in hand with the nice throughput that we get from ActiveMQ. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit odd for us because we're used, of course, to uh, living in a restful world. So having these <laughs> persistent connections is, is a different kind of network architecture. Um, okay, um, so there's ActiveQ's uh, homepage, but you said that uh, we were, when we were talking earlier, you were going through Apache Camel, and mm -hmm. up until recently, I'd never heard of Apache Camel, and now it's crossed my radar a few times in recent days, and, and I'll be honest, I've been a bit frustrated. I go to their homepage, and I, and I ask, well, what does this thing do? And it, it's really hard to find out. It, it does enterprise integration platforms. Well, what, 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 uh, patterns, pardon me. Well, yeah. well, what's one of those? So, so, so what does Camel actually do, anyhow, and why are you using it? I mean, honestly, I was a little confused myself when I first came across Camel. Uh, I've been using that for a little while now. Um, really what Camel's doing is providing an abstraction layer above other messaging platforms and services. So they, they talk a lot about the enterprise integration patterns, but in my eyes, actually, the more important thing is the concept of endpoints. Uh, really, endpoints in uh, Camel is an abstraction away uh, from how data can transform from one area to another area. So it doesn't matter where that data is coming from, whether it be ActiveMQ, uh, uh, SQS, SNS, or any other various messaging services, uh, you're able to basically write the same business logic code in order to figure out how message should be routed along, split up, transformed, uh, without actually having to worry about those details. And I think that's been kind of the, the big power for Camel for us and actually allowed us to quickly go from SQS and our trials straight over to ActiveMQ with very little code changes, actually. Yeah, and you could, in principle, switch to another messaging service in the future if, if you wanted to. 
Absolutely. Uh, we actually, funny enough, um, I, I did give SQS another try about uh, a little over a year ago um, just to see if the latency things had kind of subsided. And sadly, they hadn't quite yet. So switched it right back after that. <laughs> Fair enough. So we got a rule in this series that uh, we have to show actual code just to make it real. And ideally, I'd like to show code where you actually send and receive a message. So I got sure. some, you asked me to load this up in a tab here. So <laughs> Well, that, that looks like XML, not code. We'll get to some code in a minute, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely some XML. Uh, so over here at Career, we're utilizing Spring, and uh, we're still using a lot of XML. Um, honestly, XML is kind of nice because it's nice, declarative, succinct, and actually has a lot of validation, even though sometimes it gets a little bit of a bad name. But uh, what you're looking at here is a Spring XML file. It's uh, used to create and wire up a bunch of stuff in Spring. For those who are not familiar with Spring, Spring is a dependency injection and inversion of control container. So really what it's doing is it's, it's handling the nitty gritty of what objects and stuff's getting wired up and where they should go. And so if you kind of scroll down here a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, I'm following along on my screen as well, uh, to uh, see here, uh, this line 23 here, uh, this is us setting up an ActiveMQ component. Um, within Camel, the concept of a component is a little bit um, abstract. But for the most part, um, when you define one, you're basically telling the system about a, a external service um, and how to interact with that. So basically how you can define endpoints, along with a lot of the details around the serialization and deserialization of events. Um, so here I have an ActiveMQ one, and just below it actually, I wired up an SQS one too, um, just to show you it's actually pretty easy. Um, I left out the credentials because I figured I didn't want to have my account getting a big bill. Uh, seven part pass names intimidate me. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 those sometimes can get a little bit long. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so if you transition down a little bit farther, though, actually, we'll get to the meat of kind of uh, how we wire things up. And so if you skip down to the camel context on uh, line 70, uh, sorry, I think, uh, yeah, 6, 7 there, uh, you'll see kind of the starting the configuration of what camel is. Uh, so camel is based off a of context. The context uh, houses all of the rules, the routes, and all of the interchanges that are going to be passing data along. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit farther here, you'll come down to our first route definition. Oh, sorry, uh, I forgot about the endpoints. I just remember that. Uh, sorry about that. We can go back up a little bit. Uh, endpoints. I talk, made a big deal about endpoints. Uh, so on line 57 through 60 here, uh, we have the definition for some active and queue routes. And so what we're doing is we're setting up um, identifiers to basically be able to reference these that we can use as other parts of the code. And then the actual URI here is defining where these messages will go and come from. And then on line 62 here, I've actually done an example with an SQS one as well. Um, but once we have these identifiers, actually throughout the rest of the camel code, you actually won't have to have to worry about where those URs are pointing. So they're nice and centralized, and you can figure out how to point things to different locations very quickly. Um, in line 64 and 65 here, we actually have a little bit more of a special endpoint. Um, camel provides these two direct and seta uh, prefixes in order to create endpoints within the JVM. Uh, direct's pretty easy. Um, it actually uh, gives you a synchronous connection to that endpoint, and so it'll basically turn back control to the caller once the uh, event is done processing. Um, set is a little bit more interesting. Um, <laughs> set stands for segmented uh, exchange. Ah, I can't remember actually that off the top of my head right now. But basically what it means is that when you go to call this, underneath the hood, uh, Camel's creating a blocking queue along with a thread pool to actually process your events. And so you actually can call things asynchronously, and it's completely transparent to the caller. And you don't actually have to worry about that side of the equation. Um, now that we have all these endpoints, we probably should show you how to actually use them. So if you scroll down a little bit to line 78. Cool. Sorry. Oh, a little lag. Um, <clears throat> perfect. Uh, this defines a camel route. Um, a route is basically just what do you want to do with the data? So you'd be able to define a from destination. That's these first two lines, 79 and 80. You can actually, within the same route, come from multiple locations, which is kind of nice if you have different workflows that are asynchronous versus synchronous uh, or just have a lot of different eventing going on that kind of needs to stream to the same places. And then quickly, you've kind of defined up a little choice statement to basically define on a header passing the message uh, what do we actually want to do with this? And so quickly, uh, the in.header here is a simple um, uh, scripting language that comes with Camel. They actually support a whole bunch of languages, um, like Lua and a couple other things. Uh, but for this one, this one was just kind of a simple one to use here. And then also you'll notice these Camel.2 uh, statements. These are actually routing events to other destinations, which were part of the endpoints I defined above. But the nice thing you'll see here is that there's no reference to ActiveMQ. There's no reference to SQS. Uh, you actually have a consistent processing model that no matter what services you're using, you're going to be able to move forward. And so um, actually you can step into the code now um, uh, to actually show you how you interface directly with this camel context uh, from an actual code perspective. So let's see here. Uh, keep on scrolling down. Now, hey, stop, stop. What language is this? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, this is Kotlin. Uh, so uh, when we started the company, we actually started writing with Java, um, but more and more frequently, we've actually been jumping over to Kotlin because it's a it's a great language. It runs on top of the JVM. Uh, it has a little bit more modern niceties. Uh, you can tell it's a little bit less verbose than your typical uh, Java code, but it's completely um, compatible with all uh, Java libraries. And actually, yeah, you can interchange. Right. Let's, let's just let's just stop sure. and drill down on that one. Sure. I think it's important. Unlike yeah. some other modern JVM languages, I'm not going to mention. Kotlin really, really is totally compatible, right? You can just call back yeah. and forth transparently. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, they've done a great job of being able to both have Kotlin libraries call into Java and Java call, uh, libraries call into Kotlin. Um, I can't say that that's the easiest across all the other JVM languages, and that's why kind of for us it's been a uh, ideal language to start the migration with. Um, and, yeah, we, we've actually really loved it. Um, so, yeah, so if we keep on going down a little bit more here. Let's see here. So uh, just create a quick application class uh, just to start a runner. Uh, and then kind of the meat of this is the producer. So this is basically how you send a message. Uh, at the top here, uh, we have a couple annotations with some properties. Uh, the annotations through the uh, magic of Spring and Camel uh, will wire up uh, everything here to actually go to the right endpoints along with creating a producer template. A producer template is just an abstraction uh, with Camel that allows you to interface with the context and send events to it. Um, also, Camel, while is very nice to use with Spring, it doesn't actually require to use with Spring, but you do get a lot of functionality and some stuff for free. Uh, but now if you kind of in line 66 here, we have a send event call. And in this, we're actually going to send a message to the schedule event endpoint and create an exchange. Um, exchange is another uh, abstraction Camel provides. Uh, basically, it's a way to define the message you're going to pass to the context, um, and that allows you to set headers, bodies, and underneath the hood, depending on the components you defined, that will do all of the serialization, deserialization, and really you really don't have to worry about it. Um, here, I just did a simple one, just pass a JSON string. Uh, there's other libraries you can include to make this a little bit more um, easy with kind of more POJO style stuff, uh, but this is just a quick example. Um, but if you actually scroll down a little, sorry, good. That's the Jackson object mapper there, I see. Yep, yep, yep. We're, we're heavy users of Jackson. Um, we, we, we do like it. Um, and obviously, uh, for web services, JSON is kind of the standard now. Um, so yeah, so we're definitely utilizing that here. Um, and actually, funny enough, if you scroll down a little farther, you'll see the send async event actually doesn't change the code much, uh, which, uh, funny enough, uh, is kind of nice. Um, the less you have to worry about async processing, uh, the less bugs and less worries you have to worry about under the hood. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of uh, how we'd send a message. And if we keep scrolling down here to this consumer class, let's see here, wait for it to get on the screen, uh, you'll see how we're actually listening to messages. Um, just like with the producer, we're wiring up some annotations, uh, which allows us to basically say what endpoints any message is coming from. And through some annotations within the actual uh, method signature, we can provide how everything maps together. So you can say one property is the body, one, uh, one property is coming from a message. You can also use a little bit lower level, like actually wiring the direct exchange in. But this makes it nice, because you don't actually have to worry about who's calling this. And actually, you could invoke the same service methods from, say, um, some RESTful code versus the async code. Um, and also, still Still, no actual mentions of ActiveMQ, SNS, or anything. Uh, you're able to kind of flip those in and out and not change any of your code. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the, the main meat of kind of how crew, honestly, internally was utilizing uh, Camel with ActiveMQ. So those uh, annotations, those are standard Java annotations? They annotation are. Um, Yep, yep, they are. Uh, they, 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 just like, it, although they're an optability, uh, the annotation processor and all those good things uh, also come along with Kotlin. Cool. Now, so you've been uh, going on about how great it is to be decoupled from the from the actual implementations and protocols, but I'm, I'm kind of a bits on the wire guy, so I always want to know yeah. what, what actual bits on the wire. So underneath all that, what protocols are actually happening? Yep, yep. Uh, so how we have it configured today is we're utilizing uh, JMS over OpenWire SSL. Um, and actually, in a couple use cases, where we actually have some node code having to contact ActiveMQ, uh, we're utilizing Stomp over SSL. Um, both have been great for us, and they've worked well. Um, Stomp has a little bit less efficiency than the, uh, the JMS protocol, uh, but it's been great as well. I see. Okay. There's actually a question coming up on, uh, on Twitch. Oh. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Simon Walter is asking, are my messages safe? So uh, in Amazon MQ, we store all your messages across multiple availability zones, actually three availability zones. So that gives you a lot of uh, redundancy, and you know we're not going to lose your messages. Um, the other aspect about safe uh, that, that might be um, being asked here is security. So actually all the messages are encrypted at rest. Uh -huh. um, it's using uh, our service managed keys, but they are KMS, at rest. KMS. It's using uh, KMS under the hood. 
Um, and uh, everything's encrypted at rest, and all the connectivity, Brock mentioned they're using OpenWire SSL, so all of our connectivity is, is enforced actually to be um, SSL or TLS. Cool, excellent. Well, since you, you mentioned uh, Amazon MQ, so far we've just been talking about Active. So you just, uh, after some years of doing this, switched over from Active to, to Amazon MQ, the managed version. So yep. want to tell us the story of how you, know, how you decided to do that and why? <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of fortuitous, actually. So um, we've been using Amazon, uh, sorry, ActiveMQ since the beginning of the company. And uh, really, we it was great. It got us started. It was easy to set up in the early days. Uh, some of the configuration was awesome. Uh, but honestly, as we started to scale as a company and started getting more usage and more activity, uh, keeping up with the maintenance and configuring the JVM and all, all those fun things started to take a toll, especially for kind of a smaller engineering team. Like, you want to focus on building good product. And so, uh, funny, right at the peak of kind of some of our issues with this, um, I was signing into the AWS console, and funny enough, I saw uh, an Amazon MQ ad pop up in the right corner there. Um, clicked through, started looking through some of the features functionality, um, realized that it handled a lot of the HA uh, encryption, SSL stuff that we're going to need to do anyways from a compliance perspective, uh, along with the ability not to have to host it ourselves. It was kind of a no-brainer to switch over. Uh, so basically, when I went ahead and did it. Cool. So uh, how much work was it? Um, <laughs> it? It went pretty quickly, actually. Um, because of how we set everything up with just kind of redirecting endpoints and changing things through Camel, um, I think uh, I started testing in our development environments, and about two weeks later, we were ready to roll out to production. Honestly, you probably could have done it even a little bit quicker, uh, but actually we tried to solve a little bit of our um, uh, scaling issues around how we can add more brokers uh, on demand uh, as we were trying to do the migration. So uh, I'm, I'm going to... Go off script a little bit, and you sure. use the word mi migration. And, and I noticed that migration makes senior engineers blanch and, and look scared here, here at AWS. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you have messages in flight. How, how do you switch over? Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was definitely a challenge. Uh, and really, we had to end up doing is standing up a lot of parallel environments. Um, so basically, uh -huh. we could start routing traffic, bleeding queues, stuff like that, um, as we were kind of pushing things over. Um, and really, for that near that small period of time, you actually have basically double the infrastructure to worry about, um, which obviously is a, a, a central place where things can go really wrong. <laughs> uh, but you have to be very careful and make sure that you're configuring everything properly to do so. Cool. So, uh, that, what's your architecture like? I have a I have a picture here. I think yeah. you sent us about the architecture. You want to talk us through how that all fits together? Sure, sure, yeah. I sent you over a quick little diagram here. Um, so, so we did something a little bit interesting, actually. It's a little bit um, atypical from some of the setups I've seen uh, with ActiveMQ in the past. Um, we actually, so in the early days when we set this up originally, uh, we did a lot of client-side load balancing. So we'd configure the clients on the producer side of the equation to send to multiple different brokers so we didn't necessarily have any one broker getting the brunt of the load. Also, if we needed to, we could restart things, rip things out as we saw fit. The problem with that setup, though, is that we actually had to bounce all of our services every time we started messing with the brokers. Um, which is not ideal, especially if you're trying to do things more dynamically as loads kind of growing, stuff of that nature. And so what we ended up doing is we utilized another great uh, AWS product, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon NLB, uh, Network Load Balancer. And we actually ended up putting um, our um, Amazon MQ HA pairs behind that load balancer. And what this bought us actually is now we can freely um, add and remove brokers on the fly without any of our services being really none the wiser. Um, they are persistent connections, so there is a little bit of a failover happening once we rip stuff out, but it's, it's pretty uh, transparent. Um, and it happens very quickly, and NLB um, provides a little low, very low overhead to these connections, and so it, it's been great for us. Um, and then also, to walk into the other part of it, though, is that the, uh, the load balancer solves a lot of the production side of the equation. You still end up having to do a set of consumers per broker. And so for us, though, we've utilized uh, Amazon ECS uh, with some auto-scaling of services to actually be monitoring each of those brokers and then processing messages off those. And really, as we start adding more brokers, we just have to add ECS services, uh, companions, basically, uh, to keep that processing up. There's a question here, actually, kind of related to this, Brock. So Simon Walter, again, followed up. Um, he asked, Brock, have you done any nope. actual failovers? Yes, I just saw that question. Uh, yes, we have. Um, uh, mostly intentionally, actually. Uh, in the early days when we were testing in the dev environments, uh, we'd start ripping out brokers and try to kill the service a little bit and actually worked pretty well with this setup. And then uh, in the more production environment still today, we actually we, we, we do have to restart brokers every once in a while. We have to do things around some maintenance. Um, and we've had little to no issues, actually. Um, it, it's been pretty great. Um, I do know that managing it ourselves, we, we did see some issues a long time ago. <laughs> and really with ActiveMQ, it, it does its best 
uh, trying to maintain uh, the, the data as well as possible. But one of the nice things about Amazon MQ is that um, a lot of those worries uh, you don't have to worry about, and especially with the infrastructure you guys have set up, um, it allows a lot more reliability, and I, I don't have to. I can trust a lot more on the infrastructure from that. Can we take another question on that? Yeah, yeah sure. Time? So, because uh, there's a related question, um, I don't know how to pronounce this name, BB Sajka, I guess. <laughs> he said, historically, Amazon MQ, or actually Active MQ, sorry, had unclear HA options. <laughs> there was things like Zookeeper and Level DB. Um, I'm not sure if you ever used those, Brock, but I did. he's asking, <laughs> how are those handled by Amazon MQ? Um, uh, is that a completely Amazon HA implementation or a two node AMQ setup with a shared Amazon storage? So, the way that actually works, the way we've implemented that, it is a shared uh, shared storage. That's an Amazon shared storage, as I mentioned, across multiple AZs. And the failover is actually we have two uh, brokers, one in uh, each AZ. And we're using that shared storage. We're actually using the Kaha DB, which is kind of the standard um, storage recommended for ActiveMQ now. Um, so we have a shared storage. We have an active passive. And so the failover we're just talking about is, is if there's an issue with one of the brokers, it fails over to a second AZ. And because it's in another AZ, even if, if there's a complete, if an AZ got taken out by a tornado or something, um, you're, gonna, you're still going to have your data mm -hmm. and your broker up and running in another AZ. Okay. And what do we say about the, how long it takes to fail over when that happens? Yeah, you know, typical is, uh, you know, depending on, on, you know, if it's kind of a, a managed failover or if, if it's a complete um, complete outage, but anywhere from 10 to 90 seconds. Oh, so not bad. It's really. not that bad. Yeah. Not bad. Now, when I first started talking to you, I was, I knew you were a mobile app and I was actually kind of shocked that you weren't talking to, to active from the mobile because a lot of people do that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and so so you've in fact got your, your your everything coming in through your own multiplexer and your own load balancer and so on. Um, so two things. First of all, I guess when you do have a failover, the NLB is going to help in that point, right? And, and shed traffic elsewhere, so so nobody will ever yep. even see it. Is, is that right? That, that that is very true. Um, and that's actually one of the biggest benefits of having the NLB is that even with broker failover, there is some uh, latency for the broker becoming available again, and this allows us to kind of distribute that traffic and just kind of route around it. Uh -huh, okay, so I, I think there's probably a message here is that anybody who's thinking about writing a message intensive mobile app might want to think about putting some of their own layers of infrastructure in between the mobile and the messaging, which, which is what you've done. That looks like a, a, a good architectural pattern to me. Okay, so in the script we were going to talk about failovers, but hey, um, it sounds like the, the, <laughs> I think they, we covered they, that. <laughs> they, got, they got in front of that. Um, oh yeah, so let's talk about latency and so on. So because Active uses this nailed up TCP IP, it's got a great latency story. You don't have to set up and tear down HTTP connections and so on. But on the other hand, it's also not as elastic as something like SQS can be because you're, you're, you're wired to a broker, right? And yep. those brokers can run pretty fast, but when they run out of gas, they're out of gas and they're just not going to go any higher. So, and messaging does tend to be spiky. So, you know, are you comfortable with that? Uh, I mean, yeah, we're doing pretty good with that perspective. Um, we've actually have scaled out enough to where it's usually not an issue, it didn't, no matter how spiky it gets. But the biggest thing that actually is our infrastructure that we're going to be adding probably in the near future here is the ability to actually stand up uh, HA brokers uh, according to certain metrics such as Q volumes, uh, Q latency, stuff like that. Um, and actually with our NLB setup, it's actually be pretty easy from the infrastructure side of the equation. It comes now more to a lot of DevOps work and a lot of infrastructural components that we're going to need to build in-house. So you're not seeing your your brokers running too hot? Uh, they, they can get hot at times, and right now it takes a little bit of uh, intervention to just quickly get, kind of get some brokers in place. Um, but uh, it, it, it's been holding up pretty well. Okay. So how about all, all the DevOps stuff? Monitoring, logging, alarms. Uh, oh, give yeah. us some good advice from somebody who's been there and done that. Um, being that I had to write all this from scratch uh, myself a, a couple times, uh, Amazon MQ has been pretty great. Um, it automatically integrates straight into CloudWatch. So a lot of the metrics that you're interested in, things you need to see are readily available. Um, and also on top of that, you can do nice alarming on the size of uh, the queues. You can do alarming on missing consumers, uh, stuff of all that, uh, um, stuff like all that. Uh, it's actually been um, a lot more pleasant to work with than a lot of the infrastructure I had to write myself because we actually had to monitor not only uh, ActiveMQ, we had to monitor the jobs that were actually pulling ActiveMQ for these metrics. Um, so that was always kind of a fun component to juggle. Cool. Another question coming for you, Brock. Um, so ActiveMQ, or I guess AmazonMQ, has been solid, no data loss? 
Yeah, um, yeah, we, we, we've had no issue with data loss uh, with Amazon MQ. Uh, we actually, back a long, long time ago, uh, we didn't lose any actual user data, but there was some issues with um, <laughs> ActiveMQ uh, failing over and actually not quite coming up properly a couple times. Um, and actually, it's, it's nice to know that in, in the uh, probably six, seven months we've been using Amazon MQ, uh, we really haven't had any issues. So, so peeking a bit behind the curtains, I can remember when we were... Uh Getting ready to launch at reInvent, the there, there were some some late hours burned guys with the guys oh, yeah. working on the failover. I can remember that. <laughs> there was a there were some stressed out looking engineers there, but but they, they got it they got it done. So good on them. Um, so it seems to be working out for you, okay. But uh, you know nothing's ever perfect. What, what, what else do we need to do to make this thing you know even better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think for us um, a couple things. Uh, first off, uh, visibility. I think it's sometimes a little bit tough to determine what actual um, HA, sorry, which broker is actually active in the HA pair, uh, which sometimes for debugging perspective and trying to get to things is actually makes it a little bit tougher. Uh, another big thing is uh, just even more uh, metrics around kind of uh, the speed of the broker starting up, the health of kind of the uh, message journals and Kaha DB, just a little bit of lower level stuff because sometimes we don't necessarily know if it's a application level problem or something wrong with the interaction with the service. And so some of that would be very nice. Um, and also um, instant sizes. Uh, when we actually were using ActiveMQ ourselves, uh, we actually were scaled up uh, to a little bit bigger instances than the ones that are offered right now with Amazon MQ, um, which is fine. We just had to create a couple more brokers, but having some optionality there would be a little bit nicer. Um, and then the final one is um, cloud formation. Um, we <laughs> have <laughs> we use cloud formation uh, in our stack right now to set up our infrastructure, um, and in order to kind of uh, make. Uh, Amazon MQ play nice with that. We've had to kind of jump over some hoops uh, around some lambdas and some other things uh, to make that kind of uh, interact. So how about it? Cloud formation is coming. Should be ready in the next uh, couple of months here. Uh, <laughs> team is working on it uh, one floor down from here as we speak. As we speak. <laughs> Better get on those instances too. Okay. Thanks, Brock. I think that's a pretty complete picture of how Active and Amazon MQ fit into a modern messaging application. So, so thanks for that, and I want to talk to, 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 to Trevor about a couple of things, but, but stick around and uh, feel free to give Trevor a hard time if, he's, if he says anything that doesn't uh, you know, ring true to you based on your experience. Um, so Trevor, there were a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about. So um, this whole notion of running hybrid with part of your, your app in, in the cloud and part of it still mm -hmm. on-premise and so on, is that a real thing? Yeah, hybrid's been a really hot topic. I mean, since we launched this at reInvent, um, we've actually been a little surprised how much that's come up. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of our customers that still have uh, some things that they want to maintain on-prem. Uh, for example, even mainframes, believe it or not. Mainframes, I have a picture. Um, so, so <laughs> there we go. So, uh, okay, hold on a second. That, that's really not fair. Modern mainframes look really cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's snazzy. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, there's some... Um, you know, not everything is, is moving to the cloud immediately, um, and, and many customers have, have some things on-prem, either because it's going to stay there forever or they're doing a staged migration, so they might mm -hmm. be migrating to AWS, and they might want to do that you know, over a, in a kind of a phased way. So um, ActiveMQ supports this really cool feature called Network of Brokers, and uh, it actually lets you connect to brokers. So you could have a broker on-prem, like an ActiveMQ broker just running on a on a server on-prem and then um, connect that to a broker in the cloud and voila, you have some... Or to the clients, it just looks like one broker then? And it just yeah, yeah it. exactly. Um, I think we have a blog on that as well that you're going to pop up. Um, yep. <laughs> Greg Share, uh, one of our solution architects, wrote a great blog on this, so check it out. Um, sort of explains how to how to set that up and, uh, and forward from on-prem to the So I guess you'd pay a little bit of a latency price having a network of brokers. Yeah, perhaps. Um, I don't think it's it's huge. I mean, it, you know, as long as you have good network connectivity between uh, on-prem and, and the cloud, and we've got options there like Direct Connect um, that right. some customers are looking at as well. Cool. Yeah, any experience with network of brokers there, Brock? Uh, actually, yeah, we a uh, long time ago I worked with a pretty intricate network uh, set of network of brokers. Uh, really, they're wonderful. Uh, they actually get things kind of moving around pretty quickly. Uh, really, though, the network hops kill you. Um, it's just a matter of how many hops you have to get to, and also there's a little bit of load balancing between knowing what brokers need data and don't need data that kind of uh, can cause some headaches sometimes. <laughs> but still, it's a, it's a valuable tool for our customers. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, so there's that blog. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, so the compatibility. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, yeah, so I mean, um, so we're, you know, Brock is talking about ActiveMQ. We've got a lot of customers that we're already running Active, and it's a pretty straightforward switch. Um, but we've got a lot of customers that are running things like IBM MQ or TIBCO, more of our enterprise uh, customer base. And 
they might not want to lift and shift that as they move into the cloud because they want something managed. They want to kind of simplify their lives. So, I mean, it's one of the things we really liked when we when we looked at you know ActiveMQ is it's got that JMS compatibility, which most of these brokers tend to tend to run on. Um, it's also got AMQP, you know, a bunch of other APIs and protocols. What about so, the .NET world? Yeah, for the .NET world, um, there's a NMS actually, which is. Um, I don't think it's an actual standard, but it's a .NET variant of JMS, right. and um, so it's basically the same JMS kind of metaphors, but in a, in a .NET. Yeah, yeah. I got to say, Active. Just you look at the list of uh, things it supports. It's a forest of acronyms. I, I got to admit, I don't know what, <laughs> what half of them are to, to tell the truth. <laughs> okay, so um, you know, you're the product manager. You're probably the closest person in the world to what people are actually doing with this stuff. So, yeah. what, what patterns are we seeing? What are people actually doing with with I mean, this hasn't been out that long. It's only been a few months. But. Yeah, it's, it's only been a few months. I mean, what I uh, mentioned before, so we are seeing a lot of people that were running open source brokers like uh, Active or even RabbitMQ saying, hey, we, did, we just don't want to be in the business of managing um, our own brokers anymore. Very similar to what we saw with RDS, people getting right. out of the mm -hmm. kind of managing their own database business. So, so that's been a huge trend. Um, the other one is, you know, just coming back to Camel again, I know we kind of covered that a lot, but we've seen a lot of... Um, a lot of people using Camel, um, you know, Brock's use case is an interesting one. The other one is just integrating, uh, you pull up the blog here, yep. people are using Camel to integrate with some of the other AWS services. So some of the serverless things like Lambda okay. um, are interesting there. So you can uh -huh. maybe have some data coming off some, some older apps and you want to now, you know, integrate that into um, some, some analytics or maybe even some machine learning. Um, and Camel, Camel has connectors to, to a lot of AWS services. So um, there's another blog here that another one of our solution architects wrote that uh, kind of talks about how to use Amazon MQ to, to do that, to integrate with, with some of the other uh, oh. AWS services. In immense detail. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, check, out, check out Camel. It is, it is pretty cool, and um, it's been a big trend. Cool. Excellent. Well, folks, uh, any more questions we should deal with? Because I think we are getting close so, to the okay, end. There is, there is another question here. Um, where was it? Uh, nope, we covered the safe one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions actually at the moment. So in that case, well, thank you all for dialing in um, from San Francisco. Uh, and uh, thanks for joining us, Trevor. And to you folks out there, thank you for joining us. And with that, we will shut down and see you next Thursday.